Roger. Roger. Yeah. Well, we're going to call this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. Um, let's uh, take a minute and let's start this night in a word of prayer. Pastor Joe Don Cooper, will you come up and lead us in prayer, please? All rise, remove your hats for the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise, remove your hats for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, under God, and justice for all. And if you would remain standing, Lynn, will you come sing? If you would remain standing, Lynn, will you come sing? Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. All the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets everybody for coming to uh, the Granville County's very first Republican Sheriff's debate in our county's history and we have a wonderful turnout we have three wonderful candidates I'd like to quickly thank next door radio who we're live on the air with right now broadcasting uh, those watching on our YouTube channel and those watching on Facebook live uh, welcome and um, without any further ado I'd like to introduce AJ Dowd from Surrey County, from Pilot Mountain, 
AJ uh, Mayberry. Mayberry. <laughs> AJ is the current finance chair of the North Carolina District 10 uh, Congressional District. He also serves on the uh, North Carolina GOP Chairman's Cabinet. He's the president and CEO of American Funeral Partners. Education. He's the former Education Lottery Commission. Education. Under Education Lottery Commission. Governor McCrory. McCrory. He's the former McCrory. North Carolina. He's the former North Carolina political liaison to the Trump White House. He's the former uh, vice president of the Police Athletic League. Athletic, Athletic League. And while he was the vice president, he was instrumental in passing the Missing and Exploited Children's Act, which is what we call the Adam Walsh Act, uh, which we have a number of folks sitting in prison right now, right down the road in Butner, because of that act. Thank you very much. Thank you for what you do, sir. Uh, also, he was a ra talk radio show host on WPAQ, Mount Airy. And this is not his first debate that he's moderated. He's moderated a number of uh, judicial debates. He's moderated a number of house race debates. And probably the biggest debate that you've ever moderated was the congressional race between Mark Walker and uh, Phil Berger. That's right. So we're in good hands tonight. You're in good hands tonight. And with that, A.J. Dowd. Thank you. Granville County, great to be back here again. Great to see so many friends, Sandy. Uh, I mean, great to see so many of my old friends here, and thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. Um, but as I said backstage a few minutes ago, I think we all need to give a round of applause for these three gentlemen for stepping up. <laughs> and fortunately or unfortunately, um, up our way, and as I travel the state for the party, and a lot of enti other entities, <clears throat> it is very, very tough. One of the toughest races you could run for is sheriff um, for several reasons, and I think most of you all know, but let's go ahead and reiterate that. One, because of the protection of our community, because of we want to make sure we have a safe community, but the sheriff touches everybody's life more than any other political position. The sheriff also in North Carolina, as many of you all know, is the constitutional officer to protect our second right amendments, to protect our freedoms. And as we know, as some of the things that have happened in the past, a lot of the sheriffs, such good friends of mine as Sam Page or Terry Johnson, uh, have been gone after by the federal government for their stances, and they ultimately won because of their community support. So ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and once give them a, a round of applause and introduce you to your... <clears throat> three candidates. Uh, I also want to go ahead and, and, and acknowledge at this particular point, uh, which I will in a second, the fairness that the, your Granville officers went through. But let me go ahead and, and we're going to do this in alphabetical order because that is the fairest way I can know how to do it. So alphabetically, Vance Johnson, go ahead and sit down and give everybody a wave. Give him a hand. <laughs> Mr. Clint Owens. Next one up, uh, you go in the middle. <laughs> I think your name's in the middle, isn't it? Uh-oh, somebody played whatever. Let's see. Go ahead and sit down wherever your name's at. And of course, uh, Rob Morris, we go thank you very much. One of the things I have the honor and privilege of doing uh, for the party and for out of love, out of fairness, is the fact that um, your officers, Chairman McHenry and Michael, your vice chairman, went extremely out of their way to make sure that this was the purest form of debate that you could find. One of the things I tell everybody I do between the debates and the conventions in our party, I've probably done close to 75 to 100 of them in the last probably five to eight years. And the reason it's worked so well is, I don't know your internal politics. I don't know who's supporting to. I've met these gentlemen, which they'll all swear to, only for a few minutes, but we kind of bonded because I was a police officer. They have law enforcement background or uh, they were first responders background. 
So we had that common bond that we talked backstage, but I don't know who's what, who's for what, and so that way it makes this a pure situation. So let's give your officers a hand for keeping this as pure as possible uh, and making this as fair as possible for you gentlemen and for <laughs> you audience. One of the things that uh, they did go over backwards were there were over 70 questions submitted uh, for these candidates this evening. Uh, in case you didn't know, the emails that you had sent in and your questions came directly to me, and I did not see them for the first time until, you gentlemen will swear again, until I opened up the file backstage because I had to print them up earlier. So I'm even, if I stumble a little bit with the questions, it's because I'm also seeing them for the first time. There were some questions that looked like attack questions out of respect for you and out of respect for the party and more out of respect for these gentlemen who are, who are giving their, their personal careers uh, a dash by running for public office. We're not going to obviously do any questions that look like it's a personal attack. So uh, we're going to try to keep this as pure as possible. Uh, in keeping in those lines, I also want to go ahead and make mention to you all as the audience members uh, a few things that I personally ask you to make this really, really good. You've probably heard this before in other debates, uh, whether it's for president or governor or senate, uh, and that would be let's have respect no matter wherever we're at when this is all done and over with, that we respect and remain together as true conservatives, true Christians, and, and work together for a better community. But in the meantime, no shouting out during the questions, no, you know, clapping, you know, no disrupting, uh, anything you can to make this as nice as possible because everybody wants to hear everybody else's answers. So I'm going to ask you to hold the question, uh, excuse me, hold your clapping and everything until the end of their period of time. We do have a timekeeper. He's going to let them know when 30 seconds before the end of their time frame is done. And they're going to also let you know, he's going to let you know when the time period has ended. Uh, in case some of you are wondering, there are multiple mics on the, on the, on the uh, tables. And hello, radio station. And the radio station. <laughs> uh, obviously, I wanted to explain to them so they understood that the mic that counts so you could hear is a portable mic that they will be passing back and forth to each other. The ones that are permanently affixed with the red lights are for the radio station. So, uh, so you guys know that there's where we're at and maybe why they're not talking into these mics. There might be a reason that they want to make sure you, because you all spent a Friday night being here, uh, hear their responses and their questions and their positions. So having said that, we're going to go ahead and go ahead and get started. I'm going to open up the file for the first time. And uh, what I'm going to do, we're going to go in the order I previously mentioned. The rules that were set down, uh, and I'm sorry, for doing this, Chairman McHenry, but we all decided in the back that we were going to revolt your rules here. Um, <laughs> you would put down one minute for introduction remarks and telling a little bit about themselves. Uh, I couldn't even tell you about what time of day or what I ate for lunch. So we're going to go ahead and give them two minutes to go ahead and tell them about themselves. And if we can, we're going to try to go and we're going to go in alphabetical order to begin with, and then we'll, we'll reverse. Uh, uh, we'll go back and forth alphabetical one way, and then we'll come back the other way. So alphabetically, again, uh, it looks like that uh, Mr. Johnson will be the first. So go ahead, two minutes, timekeeper, and stand up and tell us about yourself. And yeah, be sure you share the mic with each other so everyone can hear it. Good evening. Thank you for coming out on this Friday uh, to hear us speak. Uh, my name is Vance Johnson. Uh, I've been in law enforcement now for 29 years, and um, I'm currently the assistant chief in Henderson. I've been the police chief at two different agencies. Um, I've done a lot of things in law enforcement. I've been a K-9 officer. I've run a SWAT team. Um, I've, I've run multiple budgets. Uh, I've done a lot of things administratively. Um, and as I, as I sit back and watch this, this race, you know, I, I felt like I had something to offer Granville County. My family lives here. My grandchildren will, will be raised here. It's important, I think, that we we do things the right way, and I think I, I, I am the candidate to do that. Um, I think that what's unusual about this debate is that you've got three conservative candidates. So I think 
you know, I think we've got some similar ways of thinking, certainly. Um, and I do commend both of these gentlemen for running. So it's, it's, it's not anything personal. Um, I think you'll see that, that we don't always agree on how things should be accomplished. Um, and I think that's what um, I, we need to focus on tonight is, is that, you know, how, how we're going to get things done. Um, but I, I do think with, with three conservative candidates, I think tonight is, a, is definitely going to be a good night to sit back and see which one you think is going to take it in the right direction. Um, and I think that's important. So, so really, really pay attention to the questions and, and listen to listen to us and and help make that decision tonight. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're here, and just like uh, the, the moderator has said, I think that it's it, it is a difficult position. And I know, you know, we, we've got a lot of uh, unknowns still because of the filing and the dates, and we're talking about that with people outside and things are just kind of crazy. And um, you know, it's it's difficult. You know, I want to thank my family. They come out and support me, you know, everywhere I go. Um, you know, and they have to put up with this stuff. And uh, everybody that supports me, I appreciate you coming out here. It means a lot. Um, everybody here, I want your vote. That's why I'm here. I'm asking for your vote. Um, so, and I would appreciate that if uh, at the end of the night, hopefully I'm the, I'm the person that you choose. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Morris, your turn, sir. Okay. Good evening. Um, I did write a script for my opening speech because I don't want to leave out any details. Um, I imagine when I start answering the questions, you're going to hear a lot from my heart, my training and experience. But for right now, I'm going to read off this script, please. Good evening. First, I want to give thanks to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, who gives me the strength to continue on this highest calling to serve the people. I am in my 36th year of being a public servant and protector to our nation and communities. Thank you to each of you for taking time out of your day to be here. I hope that you will be able to gain the confidence to support our campaign. I say our campaign because it is your decision to elect who will be the next sheriff. Since I announced my intent to run in April of 2021, I did not know that I would be the first Republican candidate for sheriff in over 100 years. And with your support, I will be your Republican candidate come May 17th and be elected on May the 8th. To A.J. Dow, thank you, sir, for making the journey to Granville County to be our moderator. Thank you. I started my public service in 1986 when I joined the Navy. During my career, I was fortunate to lead many, many sailors and manage, it, manage some million-dollar budgets. I retired as a chief petty officer in 2007. I then started a second career as a law enforcement officer and retired in 2020. I currently work for a private police company. It is no secret that the Sheriff's Office has been the focus of illegal, unethical practices and trouble maintaining honesty. We need new leadership. In 2019, I decided to run for Sheriff and bring the three T's to the people of Ground County that they deserve. And that's trust, truth, and transparency. Thank you. The, the candidate who's not quite coming from law enforcement, though in my time I have been a first responder. I have 20 years of business management, and that's working with associations, working on budgets, and you know, COVID really hit us hard. So you had to come up with some creative ways to you know, work within your budgets. I have management, we have 35 employees, so I've had years of management training and my administrative training, which you know, is in turn was working with budgets. You know, I felt back in um, back in October, I felt, you know, Lord leading me to run. And, you know, as having not having law enforcement experience, I kind of, you know, pushed that aside. But the nudge just, you know, kept coming. So I said, okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll step forward and I will run. Because, like, uh, you know, Mr. Moore said, there's been a lot that's gone on in the sheriff's office. And until good men stand up and do something, it will continue to happen. And that, that's the main reason that I'm running for sheriff. I feel my years of business management and business administration is exactly what the sheriff does. He's a manager and he's an administrator. 
He relies on his team below him to handle law enforcement duties, his chief deputy. They're kind of like the executive officers of the business. And that's why I feel everything I've done the past 20 years translates over into the sheriff's office. So that's why I feel at this time and with this situation we're in, I'm the perfect one to be the sheriff for Granville County because I'll bring the administrative corrections that need to be done to get things worked out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't, don't go anywhere. You're going to have the first question up. Ooh. Again, you could answer from sitting down or whatever you feel comfortable in doing. And like I mentioned to you all earlier, there were a lot of questions submitted. Uh, if we took the regulated time of approximately two minutes each, we'd be here for three hours. So, so I want to apologize now if someone did submit a question and it's not read, it's only because we want to get you out in time before Waffle House closes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> And having heard that, we're going to go ahead and, and ask you to go ahead and answer the first question. We'll come back this way again. And the first question, uh, I'm not going to ask the person uh, who submitted it, uh, but I do have their names and they'll know who it is. Explain the term constitutional sheriff and how it is different from supporting the U.S. Constitution. This question is for all the, all the questions I'm going to ask is going to be directed to all the candidates, no individual questions. So that's the, the question. Okay. The Office of Sheriff is sworn to hold up the Constitution. That means everything he does, everything he goes toward has to be in support of that Constitution. People's rights, uh, they're not privileges, they're rights. And the Sheriff is there to uphold those rights. And, uh, you know, that's what we're called to do. Brent, pass the mic down. Okay, well, we have the U.S. Constitution and then we have the North Carolina Constitution. The guidelines for the Sheriff's Office, are, they fall under the North Carolina Constitution. In that position, the difference is it's an elected position for the Sheriff. So it's a Sheriff for the people. Uh, I, I think the, what the question is, is trying to get to is, uh, I think I've, I've taught constitutional law for over two decades in basic law enforcement. Um, I'm very familiar with the Const U.S. Constitution and the North Carolina Constitution. And being a constitutional sheriff is standing up for the Constitution no matter what. Being supportive of the Constitution, eh, you might waver a little bit here and there. I think case law does dictate Constitution on a daily basis, and I read case law daily. I know that sounds boring but I keep up with case law. Um, being a constitutional sheriff is certainly different than just being supportive of the Constitution. Um, I think you can waver there. Um, and, but I do think you need to be familiar with case law and know, know that what's going on with, the, with the, how the courts are ruling. We have a very conservative Supreme Court with the United States Supreme Court, so they, they are helping us um, you know, with, with those. So it's important, but there is a big difference there. Thank you. Thank you. Hang, hang on to Mike, you're going to answer the next one. Uh, I am reminded, please everybody turn your cell phones off. Make sure there's no noise, no ringing. Act like you're in church. <laughs> the next question was submitted, uh, had about six questions in it. So I'm going to abridge the question to what I think is, is the meat of the question whatsoever. And here's the question. What experiences and skill sets do you possess that would motivate me to vote for you as chief law enforcement officer of the county? How would you describe the sheriff's office today, and how would you describe it two years after you become sheriff? I think that um, the sheriff's office has, the sheriff's position has been there long before any of us, and we will be there long after us. Um, my, my most important goal would be to make sure that office is better than the day I first take office. That office is important and it would be, um, I think I have, to, I have a duty to take care of that office because it's bigger than me. It's bigger than all of us. And I think we, I have to represent that. Um, skill set to, to, to represent that, number one is integrity, 100%. 
Um, that office belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to any of these three candidates. It belongs to the people. And that's why the people are making the choice. And I think integrity and honesty is the most important quality that you can have. Uh, you can certainly know how to manage budgets and know how to manage people and lead people. You can know all of those things. I think integrity is, is first and foremost. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, I've, I've got a long, long history of, of various different things in law enforcement that will certainly help me lead that organization. No doubt about that. But first and foremost, integrity to the people because that is your office. It belongs to you. Thank you. Pass the uh, to Mr. Morris. Same question. You want to repeat it or? Yes, please. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the question would be, what experiences and skill sets do you possess that would motivate me to vote, not me, but the person asking the question, vote as chief law enforcement officer of the county? How would you describe the sheriff's office now? And how would, it, how would it be two years after your sheriff in your tenure? Yes, sir. I know that my training and experience in life in the military and serving in multiple roles in law enforcement has prepared me for this. I'm a forward thinker. I'm motivated. I lead by example. Uh, I'm not going to ask my deputies to do anything I'm not going to do. Um, I've been a leader in the military. Um, I hold people accountable. But I also believe that you praise in public and you punish in pri private you can always train your folks. And I think that's what's lacking at the sheriff's office right now is there's a lack of training. We have to get our people out there and train updated. This mandated training that we go through um, every year, there are basically six courses and, and that's just mandatory training to keep your certification. But we have to send our folks out there to get better trained. What I said in my interview with uh, Next Door Radio the other night, um, you can learn stuff from people, but it's not always the right way. So we have to do things the right way, hold people accountable. But that doesn't mean that they get in trouble. They just need to be making the right decisions. You want to pass it down? <clears throat> Mr. Owens? You know, I think there's a proverb, and I, you know, I can't um, remember the, the exact verse, but I'm going to paraphrase here, is that when leadership loses vision, People just kind of run amok, but blessed is he who keeps the law. And I think right now the situation is leadership has failed the sheriff office, has failed deputies as well. And I think that first thing we're going to have to do is get in there. And we're not talking about clearing house or anything. We're just going to meet with, with the deputies and try to figure out where they are at along the way. And, uh, you know, I've come from a background where I've been through accreditations at uh, pharmaceutical companies, QS9001 companies. And I think that my main goal is to allow the audit to be finished that was started if you've read the action report. So that will be a good starting point for us to, to uh, jump off our accreditation program because that is you know, a very, very good way to, to make sure you get your paperwork right because you have constant audits. So that's going to be uh, one of the big things I want to push forward is get that accreditation done. Thank you very much. Um, just a little side note, uh, I was married to a law enforcement officer, it's my son's mother. She was in charge of accreditation, so a lot of people do not realize how important the accreditation process is to any police department or any sheriff's office. So, not pitching anybody, I just want to tell everybody that's the one thing that everybody doesn't know about that is very, very important is making sure all your smaller departments, all your sheriff's offices and all get accredited eventually so they can uh, air professionalism. Uh, we're going to have you, Mr. Owens, be the first question on the next one. And um, I think I'm going to get it out of the way because there's like 10 of these questions already of the same subject. So I'm just going to lump it together. A lot of questions, a lot of people submitted about uh, the vaccination mandates, the mask mandates. Uh, would you, you know, make your uh, employees wear masks? So let's consolidate it and have everybody go out and get out in the open. What's your feeling about the mask mandates, the, the vaccination mandates? How does, you know, your personal feelings and how you're going to translate that to uh, your staff that uh, you possibly may be supervising one day in the sheriff's department? Personally, I am not vaccinated. I've had COVID. 
I said, well, I did, you know, so I'm here talking, I'm telling. To me, it's, it's a personal choice. I can't sit there and tell somebody to get a vaccine and knowing that that vaccine could cause them to die or cause other ill. You know, we, we have uh, a co-worker whose daughter took the vaccine and ended up in surgery over uh, lymph nodes being damaged. So I think it's, it's a decision that each deputy in, uh, in the office will have to make on their own. I'm not gonna enforce mandates, I'm not gonna enforce masks. Mr. Morris? I concur with Mr. Owens's answer there. Um, it is your right, it's your body. If you choose to wear a mask, uh, uh, you know, I respect that. If you choose not to, I respect that. Um, as far as the vaccine goes, it's recommended. It's not mandatory. And anybody that doesn't want to get it, um, there will be no consequences on there. It is their choice. Mr. Johnson. I think that's a, a very interesting question. I think the county actually just passed a policy that deals with uh, vaccines and employees. I can tell you as, as a sheriff, the, uh, the, the, the employees work for the sheriff and, and I would hope that the commissioners involve the, the sheriff in the making of that policy. Um, I think that politics have no business in a vaccine. If you want a vaccine, go talk to your doctor. And I tell people that all the time. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to recommend whether you're vaccinated or not because I don't know anything about it. Go talk to your doctor. Um, if you feel like a mask benefits you, then please wear a mask. But nobody should force you to wear a mask. That makes absolutely no sense at all. But if you want to wear a mask and you feel like it helps you, great. That's your personal choice. But as sheriff, I don't think it's hard enough to find good employees as it is and to think that I, that, that, I would fire someone because they wouldn't be vaccinated. Wouldn't happen. Thank you. You're, you're gonna you're gonna have the next question up, uh, Mr. Johnson. There's also been a group of questions submitted, and again, I'll consolidate them. Um, what's your position or your all's position on the Second Amendment? Uh, citizens having guns, carrying guns, concealed weapons, uh, things of that nature. So, why don't you give us a little overview on your feelings on the Second Amendment? And All of those things sound great. <laughs> um, I think that uh, I left mine in the car, you know, so yeah. I didn't want to get you guys nervous, you know. So. Um, something happened, you know, several months ago that, that I, I don't know. It seems like it just got by the public, but it, it's the Sheriff's Association was was back in legislation that that would do away with permits. And I, and I don't know how many people realize that. Um, and it's such a redundant system now that I don't know why the, the governor decide, decided to be that. Well, I do know why, because he, he's, he's a left-wing liberal, right? But um, it, it's ridiculous. I think this, I, would back, I would back that sheriff's association to get that back and, back and forward, back in front of people. I don't think the permits are necessary. I think it's a duplicated system. I can go to a gun store and buy an AR-15 and walk out in 15 minutes with a national registry check, but I can't go buy a revolver without a permit that I've got to wait 14 days for. Uh, the mental health system um, has updated their, their uh, entries into the system. So now the national system is okay. We use that. We can use that. The permit system is something right now that it's an absolute unfunded mandate that the sheriff's office has to and put lots of resources into. And guess what? The citizens of Granville County has to pay for it. I think people have a right to carry, carry guns, and, and if you're illegal, go buy a gun. Have no issues with that. Um, I believe in the Second Amendment. I support the Second Amendment, and I carry a gun everywhere I go, but I didn't bring mine tonight because the suit was a little tight. <laughs> <laughs> Afraid someone will see that concealed bulge, right? <laughs> Mr. Morris. I won't be a victim to tyranny. I won't let you be a victim to tyranny. Our Second Amendment is, is what it is, supreme law of the land. And we will, will not be subject to being t targets to this federal government trying to take away that right. Um, I believe that there is a reason to have the permits to apply for them. Um, I'm not too sure. I really want to get with the other 99 counties and figure out why we have to charge people to do a background check. Is it a fundraising thing or, or what? I, I don't know the answer to that, but why, why does someone have to pay to have a background check done 
when you pay taxes. So it's one of those questions. I think outside the box, I'm forward thinking. But um, we're not going to give up our rights to carry guns. I like guns. I just can't shoot guns right now because you can't find the ammo. Um, so you know, we're going to protect those rights. It's on the boat that's sinking from China. Yes, sir. <laughs> and <laughs> if we outlaw guns, only outlaw, outlaws will have guns. So that's not going to happen. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Owens. Well, um, I did a video, <laughs> kind of probably a goofy video, but it's my stance on the Second Amendment. You know, um, and I made a pledge as sheriff, neither me nor any of my deputies will take place in any go government confiscation of our weapons. It's not going to happen. I'm going to put my deputies in a situation where they're going to get shot just because the government wants to come and be tyrannical and take our weapons. So uh, as for the permit system, I'll call it what it is. It's a Jim Crow law. It was designed to prevent black people from having weapons back in the day. They had to be of good character. And who got to decide who that character was? You know, the sheriff that was in charge. I'm for a constitutional carry. You know, I don't think I should have to have a permit. You know, you have the NICS background check, which, yeah, that's a good thing to go through. But having to go get a paper permit to carry, I think it's just it's a waste of money and it's a waste of time. You know, uh, and no, I didn't bring my gun tonight either, but I, I wanted to. I was itching. But, but yeah, I, I just feel that we need to um, do in that system. And I was really surprised when the Sheriff's Association came out and went for that. I was like, wow, yeah, they, they've come around. And, and it's because of the way Nix works now. The reporting is really good. Well, like I mentioned earlier, the paperwork behind it and, and uh, some of the larger departments that I've seen, some of the sheriffs I know in the larger departments, the permitting process and the paperwork behind it has just gotten so is crazy. And it's, it's actually, which people don't realize, it's taking law enforcement off the street to do paperwork. So which was mentioned here. So let's uh, give them a break and let's give them a hand for those response so far. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Owens, go ahead and, and let's uh, have you pick up the call, uh, the next question, and it's going to be a simple one. What makes you different from the other candidates? I come from 20 years of business management and administration. You know, uh, the sheriff's office is business and administra administration. So I'll be able to come in there and hit the ground running and making sure everything paperwork's being done right in the budget. You know, uh, the budget is a beast. It's fourteen million two hundred sixty-eight thousand and four hundred four dollars. That's twenty-three percent of the budget. And because of my budget experience, I'll go in there and I'll be able to work with that budget with no problem. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mr. Morris. What makes me different than the other candidates? Uh, my moral compass is true and flies true all the time. No matter if, if I'm by myself or a group, a group of people, you just have to do the right thing. And it's my duty to make sure that um, I hold the deputies accountable for that. And how can you do that if you don't lead by example? So I'm a leader by example. And I believe that my, my morals, my leadership qualities, will will show thank you very much mr johnson why am i different uh, i think that uh, my, my certainly my qualifications and my experience in leading law enforcement organizations um, makes me stand out from the other candidates for sure uh, i have you know, as, as was mentioned, I've dealt with law enforcement budgets, which are different. Um, they are different. Government runs budgets differently than, than private businesses. Um, it's not always efficient, as everybody should know, but it's different. Um, I've led many people um, in, in different capacities, whether it's on a SWAT team or training canine officers or um, leading the interdiction efforts or supervising a investigative unit or supervising a drug investigative unit. I've done, I've done those things. And I think that, that certainly makes me stand out as different from the other candidates. Um, I'm the most qualified um, and I'm the most experienced. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, keep the microphone. We've gotten several questions <clears throat> uh, and I'm gonna try to consolidate it um, about drugs 
and what's going on and particularly I'll read this question because I think this particular question summarizes the drug situation and since uh, Terry Johnson uh, who's a good friend of mine was uh, almost arrested and taken to court for the same thing uh, on Interstate 8540 but the question is um, <clears throat> The continued practicing of Interstate 85 highway interdiction. Uh, while I'm aware there's no money to be made and drugs are seized on occasion, is it really practical and effectively impacting the illegal drug issues right here in Granville County? The simple answer to that is no, not here in Granville County. Um, I would say that probably, may, maybe in a roundabout way, you know, if, if drugs are, are, are going to another, another place, it could filter back. Um, but directly in Granville County, probably not. Um, there, are, there are some benefits to it. The key to doing drug interdiction, though, is absolutely doing it the right way, uh, being transparent about it, uh, making sure that, that it's all kept up with, making sure that it's on video every step of the way. So, so it can be done effectively, but as far as how is it impacting the drugs in Granville County, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, Th those illegal proceeds that come back, which I'm very familiar with, I've handled those, those things in the past, those illegal proceeds from, from those drug dealers does benefit the citizens of Granville County, and it, and it benefits them greatly. So, so sometimes you've, you've got to weigh out the, the, those, those options. Um, do, do I think that Granville County needs to be doing that type of thing? To be quite honest, I need to, I need to get there and evaluate the process, because I think that there was questions raised during the internal investigation. I want to see for myself how it operates because I know how to operate it. And I want to ask questions. I want to evaluate it for myself. So as far as what Grandma Kenny does there, I think that, um, you know, I want to evaluate it. I don't think it's fair to, to, for me to, to gauge that from sitting here and not being inside. I think you've got to take a good, fair look at it. But that's a simple answer. Seizing drugs offered in a state no, it doesn't impact Granville County. Well, just to tag along, there was another question about combating the drug problem here in the county and uh, sheriff's respond, poor response time to South Granville. Uh, and I guess that's probably your high crime drug area. Uh, so there was a question about how would you improve that particular situation? Response so, time or, or drugs? Well, drugs and the response time. That was all mixed in with part of the question. Okay. Um, man, I need more in a minute. <laughs> um, look, re response time is an easy fix. It's a very easy fix. Um, it's called data-driven policing. It's in called intelligence-led policing. You use data to, to figure out where the calls are coming from, and, and you put your resources there. You also use data to determine what's being investigated where, how many hours are being used here. You deploy your resources where they're needed. And it's not just for major crimes, it's for all crimes. And you don't differentiate between northern and southern. You go where the calls are, because that's where you need it. Um, I'm familiar with that, I've done that. You know, I use hotspot mapping is what it's called. And if I've got a hot spot of crime, then that's where I'm gonna put all my resources at, because it makes sense. And I, now I'm not just randomly patrolling, hoping to find something. Um, the data works, the math works. Um, drugs is another whole issue. Um, fentanyl is the leading killer of 18 to 45 year olds. And you know what's scary about that to me is you look at this COVID response that we had, okay? COVID's bad. People have died from COVID. I know people who have died from COVID, okay? I'm not taking away from that. But you look at the government's response to that. And the leading killer of 18 to 45 year olds is fentanyl. What are we doing about that? We're putting smoking kits together and gonna distribute them. Does that make sense to anybody? No, it doesn't. We're not addressing that problem and it's killing more people than teenagers are dying faster with fentanyl overdoses than they are car wrecks. Absolutely ridiculous. We've got to address that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Morris, yes, sir. repeat the question again. Yes, please. 85 highway introduction, uh, interdiction with seizing drugs. And then the secondary question would be, how would you handle drug situation and uh, reduce sheriff's response time to South Granville? 
Absolutely. I'm, I love interdiction. You catch a lot of things on the highway. You catch human trafficking. You catch counterfeit items. You catch uh, U.S. currency. And you get them drugs off the streets. And you put bad guys in jail. But that isn't our main focus is Highway 85. we got to make sure that these houses that are getting broken into, we, we treat those as if it's your own house getting broken into. Not just, oh, let me just do an incident report and you could turn it in your insurance company. That's what's happening now. That is BS. <laughs> and I'm a little bit passionate about that. So, Sir, I'm a crime fighter. And when we have the resources, when we can go out there and work that highway, we'll work it. Um, I was on my way home from um, working late over in Vance County as a, as a detective, and this minivan went by me with Baltimore or Maryland plates on it, and I was in an unmarked car. I pulled it over, a trooper pulled in right behind me, and I started to do my interdiction. And the trooper was more worried about um, writing that citation because that's what the troopers do for speeding. But I ended up getting enough indicators that something wasn't right there. And I ended up... Uh, locating after the assistance of a dog um, he alerted on the on the vehicle uh, four ounces of uncut heroin that just got picked up in Henderson and he was on his way to Raleigh we have a major problem and this is no no ill will to you Vance but Henderson is a heroin capital of Central North Carolina you know it is it's bad it's not your fault this has been going on way too long and it's right next door so we got to combat it together. I mean, the bad thing is they're right next door. We should be working together. Those drug dealers, I followed them for a long time when I was um, um, a detective. They're doing their dirty work over there in, in Vance County, and they're sleeping in Oxford, you know, because there's less heat over here. Um, yes, it's absolutely necessary to combat crime on 85 if we have the resources, but it shouldn't be the priority. we got to protect the people of Granville County first and foremost. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Mr. Owens. Question is uh, about the 85 drug interdiction and uh, the drug problem within Granville County, particularly South uh, Granville. You know, I think the drug interdiction on 85 is a good thing. You know, there's the amount of sex trafficking that's picking up, fentanyl, heroin, coming through our backyard. And I feel that we need to do something to curtail that. And, uh, you know, I want these people to think that coming through Granville County was a grave mistake if you, the, the day you cross that line. You know, we need to take advantage of, of the tools we have. We need to make the stops. We need to make the rest. And we need to get the stuff off our streets. You know, if, if you have like a, a Himalayan salt shaker and you just go crank that about uh, one-tenth, and what comes out of that is enough fentanyl to kill 40,000 people when it's pure. And that, that's how dangerous that is. And I think back in, was it back in June? They found, they stopped someone in 85 that had 35 grams of that. Then they went to his house and found like another 40 grams. You know, that person should not see a light outside of a cell again. Because how many people are responsible, is he responsible for the deaths of how many people? That should be a capital murder charge for every death that you can tie back to it. And so, you know, and I think it should be a felony for, felony for every little <laughs> Or a little milligram or you know kilogram uh, so I think that I think it's a good thing to do that and um, what's the second part of the question I'm sorry about South uh, about the drug within the county drug problem within the county because of South Greenville okay now I ha also have an IT background and I think what uh, Mr. Johnson said about data driven results is 100% true I think that you know where the hot spots are that's where you need to focus and um, that's just the, I think like I said, the most intelligent way to handle that. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna pull in the crime and they're gonna move somewhere else. It will map it out, it'll be another hot spot and we'll put people there as well. You know, we need to get a hold on this. Um, you know, I don't want them to come to East Granville, South Granville, because I might shoot one, but you know, <laughs> don't come breaking my house. But right. you know, I, I think that um, basically, yeah, we need to, we, both things are, would be good, both interdiction and data-driven. Thank results. you, thank you very much. You're gonna get the first question up. There was a question submitted. I'm going to answer it because uh, I was on the uh, uh, trooper board up until last year. Uh, one of the questions were, why, you know, why doesn't the sheriff's office respond to accidents and waiting so long for the troopers? And sadly enough, uh, it's 
jurisdictional issues that's dictated by general statute that if an accident occurs on a state highway or state road the troopers have to write that report if you know and right now sadly enough last I heard it's a hundred and sixty troopers short statewide and that is causing some of the problems why it's taken so long to respond to accidents by the troopers so my answer to you is if you don't like the fact that it's taken the troopers so long contact your house members and your state Senate members and get them to change the laws where possibly the sheriff's office or the local jurisdictions can write the accident reports so I'll answer that question and that way you guys don't have to worry about that one I'm gonna start with you again mr. Owens and I'm again I'm gonna kind of blend a couple questions together because I think it's along the same subject matters from different questions questions that were submitted what's your first priority as sheriff why are you running for sheriff what makes you the best candidate and name three new initiatives well first you're gonna bring first priority is going to be the safety of the people of Granville County that's always a big person foremost now you strung a lot of these together you may have to come back behind it and repeat that okay I mean again what would be your first priority which you named why are you running what makes you the best candidate and what are three initiatives that you'll bring to the department you know the reason I'm running is I feel that the experience I have in both leadership strong leadership management and administration will transfer into the department into office and I feel that that makes me an effective leader because I know how to lean on my managers you know I'm not coming in with the fact that hey I know everything I'm gonna rely just like a CEO would do of their company they rely on their executive manager so I'm gonna rely on them a lot why come up to speed and we'll talk about initiatives will make it easier initiatives what makes you the best candidate which you answered so what initiatives would you bring to the department you know first of all you know the initiative would be how to prevent some of the drug traffic is going on how to prevent some of the sex traffic what we do to do I don't want to say stop and frisk but you know stop interdiction on the highways that would be foremost because you know there's too many of our children being exploited out there and we need to put an end to that secondly is going to be going through the office and let's find out I want to know really who did what and who knew what when and so there may be a little bit of a investigation on that you know and third initiative is you know what I call the community accountability team that would be me a sheriff meeting with a diverse group of people from small business from the you living in the county from churches and from nonprofits to meet together face-to-face and figure out how we can fix things in their community how can we get them involved involved how can we get them to trust us and how can we get them to community police so they feel comfortable telling us hey you know someone's got a lot of cars down our street at midnight think someone's selling drugs thank you mr. Owens we're gonna let mr. Morris take us and I'll make it a little bit easier we'll just say why are you running for sheriff what makes you the best candidate and what are the initiatives you'll bring okay I'll make it quick sir I my first priority is going to be evaluate for 90 to 100 days look at how that office is running while I'm watching personnel and are they in the right places I'm gonna be reading the policy manual and checking that policy and making sure it returns to what we need it to be that's gonna be the first priority but the other thing is to we got to have an SBI agent come in there and do an inventory that evidence locker you don't want to take on something that that you know that you don't know anything about so we got to do that first of all why am I running I'm upset I'm upset the way the the corruption has been going on I'm not going to sugarcoat it sir I hold police officers to a higher standard I think you've heard that already by me and you probably mentioned that a few more times tonight there's no room for for those those types of behaviors the three things that I'll do I I am one that has a platform out there I want a school resource officer in every school I believe we're a little bit top too heavy right now in in some of these 
um, departments. I'm looking at, uh, um, they got too many people in certain places. We need a school resource officer in every school. You just don't know when something bad's gonna happen. We can't take that chance. The second thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna implement a uh, city and county crime bureau of investigations. I'm gonna take some of those detectives. We have 11 detectives right now. We don't need that many in Gravel County. I know what it's like to work with six in Vance County and carry 20 cases. We don't need that many. They're juggling two to three cases. So what I'm gonna do is, is take a few of those detectives and give them the resources, send them to a lot of schooling so they can be latent print examiners. They can be uh, ballistic um, experts on it. When we have a big, big bad case over there in Creedmoor or Oxford where you have a bank robbery, I wanna send my guys over there to help the city. So not, that, to, not to rush you with your third one. Okay, and my third one is litter. I am tired of looking at trash. I'm going to get inmates out there and clean up these roads. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Same question. Uh, why are you running? What makes you the best candidate? What are the three initiatives you'll bring to the department? Uh, Malt that part. Um, I think that the, the first priority and, and the first 30 days kind of go hand in hand. I think it's an evaluation process. I think that you go in and you evaluate what you have. I think it's a mistake to sit back and talk about, I've looked at the rank structure, I've looked at that, I've, I've done layouts of rank structures in the past. I think it's a mistake to say what you're gonna do and not know what those people do already. I think you evaluate that. You have 11 investigators, but they're not general investigators. Some of those are, are drug investigators. Now, is it overstaffed? It could be, but I don't think you evaluate that from the outside. You have to do that from the inside. I'd sit down in the first 30 days and meet with every employee with the sheriff's office and find out their take and find out their visions of where we should go and, and have a team approach to how we're going to fix things. I think that the three initiatives, I, I don't disagree with the litter, but that's certainly not one of my initiatives because DOT gave up on the program and the Granville County citizens paid tax dollars to, to our state to pick up litter. So guess what? They stopped using DOC. They were gonna privatize it, like some people wanna privatize our SROs, and they wanna privatize it, and it didn't work. And now DOT says, oh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna come up with a grant to give out money. No, Granville County needs to stand up along with the other counties and demand the state do their job with our tax dollars. That's how we clean up the litter. That's not one of my priorities. My priorities would be um, accreditation. The process is already underway. If you ask questions, you know that. They're already underway to get accredited. They've already gone and gotten some policy, policies from accredited agencies. Harnett County is one of those. Um, that is critical because if you're going to hold someone accountable, that's the only way to do that with the sheriff, is to have processes in place so the, the, the citizens know that I, I, what I'm doing because accreditation will reveal that, 100%. Second initiative, I, I ride around these neighborhoods talking to people. We need neighborhood watches, probably five or six to start with, where we go and find out what people are having issues with. We talk about drugs and how bad they are. That may not be the problem in your neighborhood, and it may not be your concern. We need to know what the issues are in the community and address those. The only way to do it is to get out and talk to people Go back to old school neighborhood watch. Uh, you use technology, you use Facebook, I get all that. You use the, the next door uh, app. I, I know that's there. But face to face, you meet with people and find out what their concerns are. It's not always what you think it is. And that's what's surprising. It's not always what you think it is. Um, I think I'm out of time. So. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. I want to apologize. I'm totally winging this for like the first minutes I was doing it totally wrong but <laughs> totally was he, when he came out and said two minutes totally mixed my time up I was going two minutes on like each question but I think I'm gonna just do it like this I think you get a minute per question for each of you 30 seconds I'll throw it up you know you got 30 seconds left We'll do it that way. That's how I was supposed to do it. I got my wires mixed up. My bad. Let's give him a hand that because takes you got courage right there, my man. Own it. Own it. I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> you, just gave the, you just gave the contestants extra, yeah, extra rewards.
No, I think it's good because, you know, we're getting a lot, they're, they're putting out a lot of information, yeah, and it doesn't seem like the two minutes. I keep looking over, and I'm like going, oh my God, you know, it's like, <laughs> we're like burning in time, but I just checked that we're really, we're really pacing ourselves very, very well, so uh, we're all comfortable with it. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, <laughs> And uh, we, we really appreciate it because you guys have gotten into it. And I'm, even as a law enforcement officer or past law enforcement officer, I'm very, very uh, tickled in response, the responses you all are given. And I think they all deserve a hand because it's really, I mean, I got to tell you, I don't see any uh, Democratic congressional fluff here uh, coming from the stage. So. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. Democratic, <laughs> congressional, if you want. Okay. Um, Vance, if you could take the first question. It, it, there's been a several questions been submitted, and uh, I apologize. I, again, I don't know the background about it, um, but apparently, um, let's see, where was it? Right here. There's been some issues, I guess, with the previous sheriff, Snowball and Wilkins. There's been some indictments. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times, uh, words like, what would you do to repair the reputation? Uh, what would you do to ensure that the sheriff department gets back on track and earns the, uh, uh, the trust of the community? So I presume, because like I said, I don't, and I apologize for not knowing, there's been previous problems within the sheriff's department. And uh, uh, a lot of people here want to know what, what, can, what you all as great conservatives could do to gain the trust back in the community uh, for the sheriff's position and sheriff's department? Uh, I think I, I've said from the very, very beginning that I think that all of this stuff is playing out in court now. I think you've got to let it play out in court. That's from a law enforcement perspective. I've watched these things happen. Um, it, it's, it's taken forever. Uh, but, but you can't evaluate that. you got to let the courts do it. And they're doing it, and they're slow, right? They need to hurry up so Granville County gets some answers. Um, so as far as the, the correcting that course, I think that first and foremost, I have to be the face of integrity for that office. And I will answer to the citizens. I will answer to the citizens because accreditation will allow you to know what I am doing right and what I am doing wrong 100%. You don't need SBI agents to come in and do an inventory of your, um, of your evidence because guess what? Every quarter you're doing, you're already doing those audits and you're getting those things to find out what's wrong. You know, I think that that is where accountability is. And I will be out in the public at these neighborhood watches, and you can hold me accountable in person. And if you've got questions, I'll be glad to answer them in person. So holding me accountable and integrity is how you fix this. I think there needs to be a degree of professionalism. I think there needs to be a look of professionalism. That's part of it, certainly. Um, but to move forward, it's integrity and it's accountability and it's a way to hold me accountable. Thanks. This question is important enough. Let's do the two minutes and then we'll kick oh. to the one minute. Oh, I get another question. minute? No. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> you were already flagged, okay? <laughs> Tag, you're it. Ms. <laughs> Mr. Morris, the floor is yours. Well, I, I got to go back to, sorry to correct you, sir, but we got 11 investigators you said that including drug detectives. No, we have eight drug detectives. So we have 19 detectives, 11 of them being detectives, and eight of them being drug detectives. So I've done my homework too. The other thing, you have to have SBI come in there. Who's going to do the inventory? Your inside guys, they got 50 guns missing from the evidence locker already. You have to have an outside agency to come in. You have to have them come in. As far as uh, the former sheriffs, you know, that, that is a product of not having a Republican in office for over 100 years. That's what the problem is. They are a, they are a product of their environment. And that's why we need to get in there and show these guys, hey, you're good deputies, but you can be better. You need to, you've got to have some self-worth. And they just don't know. They just don't know. You know, when I'm driving around when I was a police officer, 
uh, I see somebody outside, I stop. I want to know who they are. I'm already in the communities doing this stuff. I probably know half of Granville County by now. I'm already doing it. I'm out there in those communities. And I'm going to be a, a, a sheriff for the people. I'm going to have open, open door policy. There's going to be set hours. And if you can't make it to the office, I'm coming out to see you. As far as uh, crime prevention, it's called saturation patrols. Where your hot spots are, and yeah, you got crime analysis doing all that. You get out there and you saturate it. You drive these people out of here. You want to make sure that these bad guys don't like Granville County. Thank you, Mr. Owens. I repeat the question, please. <laughs> Basically, you we know, know there's been corruption. There's been problems within the sheriff's office. How would you correct it uh, if your sheriff? Uh, kind Inte of is a integrity is a big thing. You know, and you're going to have to hold your deputies to the same standard that you go in there with. No, uh, they've had faulty leadership, so they may not even know what good leadership is. And when you get good leadership, people tend to get excited and get behind you and fall in pretty easily. You know, it's, it's not like herding cats at all. You, you know, they want to do good. Now, there may be a few out there that they don't feel that way. And then when it comes to that, that point in time, you know, you'll have to handle that problem then. But I think it's very important. You know, if you go back to uh, you know, the, the accreditation, if you've read the after action reports at all on the Granville County site about the investigation and what they found, so much of that is paperwork issues, falsifying, not having common sense procedures in line. And to me, to have those auditors come back and finish that audit that's what you need, and you can say, okay, at this point here, we know what's wrong, we know what's broken, what needs to be fixed, and we know what's good. And that's a great starting point. Uh, for me, yes, I would like somebody outside the department to come in and look at, at my evidence locker to make sure everything is accounted for. Uh, you know, we don't want anything just mysteriously disappearing in between, you know, cases. So that's very important. And it's kind of bothersome that, you know, 50 guns missing. Yeah, you know, and they're not at my house, I promise. But <laughs> that my wife may think so. <laughs> anyway. They're also but, not on eBay either. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But, but yeah, that, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so Mr. Owens, you'll take the next question. I'm going to go ahead and give, we've been uh, probably a little bit over an hour into everything. I'm going to, we have another question that, again, I think is, needs to be bought out, but it has nothing to do with the sheriff's office. Question is, what what would you do as sheriff with all the pollution, the vehicles, the EPA Act? Let's see, <laughs> penalties up to ten thousand dollars. What would you do? Yeah, what would you do on the planet? City of Oxford, Granville County, all have what? <laughs> Again, we all know that sheriff's office does not have the authority to enforce. Uh, major pollution issues and as, as such there is a state agency that does so so for those out there in the this listening and viewing audience call your state house member and call your st your state senator if you have an issue with pollution or uh, vehicles in your particular cities um, I'm going to use my privilege as your moderator to give about a three minute break if everybody could stand up, stretch around a little bit, the candidates, um, and then we'll go ahead.
think uh, you answered last, Mr. Johnson. Last yeah, question. Right. Who was the last one to answer? Mr. Owens. Oh, okay, Mr. Owens. So you'll be the first one up on the questions. Um, there's another corruption in the department question. There's another corruption in the department question. So that makes five people have submitted questions about the corruption in the department. Um, it was kind of funny. Uh, if people know Ronnie White, Ronnie White Tires, I was down talking to him today, and um, you know, you know, told him, "Hey, Ronnie, yeah, I'm running for." Uh, I said, "Ronnie, I'm running for sheriff." And Ronnie goes, "You can't run for sheriff." And I go, what do you mean? He says, "You're not crooked." <laughs> you know, so it's kind of no. It, it's, it's kind of like. That's what the people think around. That's what other law enforcement think when you talk to them honestly. They're like, can you guys fix what's wrong with the sheriff's office? But well, now that you spoke for a few minutes, I have to uh, give them according to procedure oh, Here you go. if they want to respond with a story or a tale. I'll pass. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, I guess he didn't discount the tires after you told him that story. No, but he did let him put a sign in his, in his front of his <laughs> place of business. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been Ronnie for 25 years. So, so. Mr. Owens, here's the question. Someone came up to me during the break, and I thought it was a good enough question uh, to throw it in the mix, and it was kind of a little bit different. Uh, we all know out there that uh, our ever popular, uh, very well loved governor, <laughs> Governor Roy Grouper Cooper, was shutting down a lot of businesses during COVID. And we also know because of those actions, a lot of mom and pop and family businesses had gone out of business. Uh, sadly enough, and I, uh, as a businessman, I could tell you that Forbes and any other <clears throat> financial paper will, institution will tell you that, uh, and I campaigned on this when I ran for Secretary of State, 80% of the businesses in the United States are mom and pop businesses. And I run a mom and pop business. So the question was brought up from the floor, and I thought it was good enough that we should mention it. Um, if, for whatever reason in the future, and uh, when one of you gentlemen as good conservatives are uh, our sheriff here in Granville County, uh, if the governor's mandate comes forth to shutting down businesses again, uh, will you respect it? Will you, will you repeal against it? Uh, how will you handle that kind of situation? Uh, if we go through that same uh, closing businesses down in the future, that, that's a, that's a tough question. Uh, my wife and I co-owned a business together, and we saw you know what um, COVID did there, and you know people were terrified; they didn't want to come out. But you know, small business is the driver of the United States, and you see the socialists trying to first take small business out because once they take small business out. They feel they have us, you know. In good conscience, I could not go shut down a business. I couldn't do it. You know, um, that's somebody's livelihood. They're not out doing anything horrible. They're not selling drugs. They're not out robbing people. They're just trying to make a living in, in the greatest country in the world. And I, I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I could not follow that directive. Okay, Mr. Morris. I don't believe it would be right to shut down a mom and pop business. Um, it is a, a a suggestion. It's not a law. We'll leave it up to the business owner if they want to take time off and close their doors. So it won't be enforced. Mr. Johnson. As sheriff, I don't work for the governor. Um, yeah. It's a constitutional position, and um, I don't answer to the governor. And my daughter and my son-in-law sitting there have a small business and when they wanted to shut down businesses, he looked at me and says, how am I supposed to support my family? And I said, you go to work, right? That's all you can do. Um, you don't shut down businesses. This is America. You, people could get COVID and drive to California. Nobody would ever know. So how are we making people shut down businesses? It's ridiculous. I don't work for the government. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I am going to ask Mr. Morris to do the first question on this one because your fan club says I'm not giving you a first, enough first chance. <laughs> Thanks, sir. But, you know, rotating around, it doesn't make a difference who's first. It's the quality of the question. But 
i thought this question would be really good about have you ever been put in a situation by a supervisor knew it was morally wrong how would you handle it at this time i don't recall being put in that situation i know that in my 20 years in the military service if somebody gives you an order to do something you do it and then complain afterwards and uh, in my law enforcement career it hasn't happened um, if it were to happen i would have to challenge it um, if it was morally or illegally wrong if i had it if they asked me to do a cover-up that ain't gonna happen um, i'll hold that person accountable i think you all figured that out by now that i'm tough on crime and i hold police officers to a higher standard law enforcement officers to a higher standard um, you know this is a profession that is a calling it's a it's a noble profession and we have it you know most people that are law enforcement officers they do this not for the pay not for the glory it's to help people because they care and if there was a leader in there that wanted um, you to do something immoral like that well he doesn't need to be a leader thank you We're mr. Owens why don't you go ahead and answer that question okay. please well I've been in just that situation uh, back when I was in manufacturing I was brought into a company who was QS 9000. They had six months of not having their paperwork correct because first of all, there's no way the techs could have done what they said they were doing every day. And they couldn't keep a manager because they, they were corrupt. That's the best way to put it. But we, we were coming up on an audit and um, I had been with UL, talking to UL, rewrote all the PMs, the procedures and everything. And so as we got closer to the audit, they would call me in the office and they'd say, hey, how are we doing? I said, we're going to be fine. We're going on probation again. But because that uh, we don't have these six months of PMs, there's nothing we can do about them. That happened for about three weeks, four weeks in a row. And the week of the audit, they called me in again. And finally, it clicked what they were asking. When they're asking, what are we going to do about the missing paperwork? Basically, they were asking me to falsify documentation. Now. You know, that could have been done, and no foul, no harm, right? But I told them I will not falsify documentation, and they yelled at me and told me to get out of the office. You know, I came in the next day, I was handed my last paycheck, and I was told, you're not the type of person leader we're looking for. And, hey, that's the best thing that could have happened to me. You know, you can't compromise your integrity. There's no money or, you know, Make it makes it seventy thousand a year. They think I'm a compromise. No, you know you can't do that because at the end of the day, all you have is your word and who you are. You know, other than that, and pay taxes, gotta do that. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I, it hasn't happened often, and the reason is is because the people that know me will not approach me with it because I know that they know that my integrity is not going to go there. Um, so no, it doesn't happen often, but I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm not going to give names, going to protect the innocent, but I was a police chief and had a uh, crime occur, which was a misdemeanor, and a leader uh, in the town uh, came to me and wanted me to make it a felony. Um, and I said, but it doesn't meet the elements. It's a misdemeanor. Uh, they, they wanted the people charged with a felony. Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm going to follow the law, uh, the elements of the law. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that, that has happened on occasion, but typically it doesn't happen because uh, people know where I stand. I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. We're going to let you uh, answer this question first. What's your position on uh, no-knock search warrants? I, I, I've kept up with cases. I've kept up with a lot of the, the um, case reviews and, and how the media has, a, has a pro, uh, approached it. Uh, North Carolina is different in, in that it has a law that deals with no, with no-knock search warrants. It actually says you don't get a no-knock search warrant. You always knock unless approved by a judge. So it's a little bit different. It's not the officer doing it. You actually request it. The judge reviews why you want it, and the judge approves those no-knock search warrants. There is a place for a no-knock search warrant. I've been on them. When this person has threatened to shoot law enforcement, when they come to, to the, the, my house and they've got on, um, guns, and we know that, there is a place for a no-knock search warrant. 
It doesn't happen often in North Carolina because North Carolina actually prohibits it, and you have to knock and announce unless you get an exception by a judge. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morris. <clears throat> Mr. Venus, I is a SWAT operator. I've served numerous search warrants. I've wrote search warrants. I have not participated in a no-knock search warrant. However, I can see where a no-knock search warrant um, would be needed. And in case if it was a violent person and you knew they were in there, then you would have to do that. Um, so we just have to follow by the letter of the law. And if, if it's required that you request for a no-knock uh, no search warrant and, and it meets the elements, then that's what you apply for. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Owens. Not being from a law enforcement background, listening to Mr. Johnson and Mr. Morris here, it sounds the perfect advice. You know, uh, if there's a someone who's violent, somebody has guns, someone who's in, has threatened law enforcement, then you can't take that chance of, of knocking and have them open fire. You have to kick the door down and you have to move, gush for days, whatever you have to do. But I think for uh, the the most, you know, people, they're not that type of person, and. You know, you knock, you be courteous, and then you enter. Thank you. Give the microphone to Mr. Morris. We'll let him do this one first. <clears throat> As sheriff, do you believe that you have the constitutional authority to protect the individual rights of the citizens of Granville County from state and federal overreach? If yes, how would you do that? Absolutely. Um, we, the Constitution dictates that. And as sheriff, you're elected, you're an elected official. So um, you're elected by the people to protect the people. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. You have the constitutional authority to protect the individual rights of the citizens of Granville from state and federal overreach, and how would you do that? Absolutely. The sheriff is the, the highest law enforcement official in the county. Um, it's my duty to protect the citizens from those things that I think are not constitutional. Um, when we were talking about being armed earlier, you know, that's in Second Amendment rights. It's because I might need you, right? Um, I, I might need to rely on a citizen to, to help me at some point. Um, absolutely, I can protect you from the state and federal overreach. Um, I, don't, I, I think it's my job to do that, and I'll do everything I can to do that. Um, you, can, you can believe that I will stand for the citizens of Granville County. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Owens. You know, in, in the same way, you're elected by the people of this county as sheriff. And my first <clears throat> duty is to their protection. And to when government starts to overreach, you know, they don't do it just once. They'll do it, go a little farther, a little further, further, further until we lose rights. And I'm not going to stand for that. You know, I'm going to protect the rights of the citizens of Granville County. Thank you. Keep the microphone, Mr. Owens. What legal standard would you use to stop a car? What standard and process for searching the car would you use? Well, on that, I would have to take and, and do what any good CEO does. I would rely on my chief deputy and uh, have, have him, who was going to be the, the liaison, liaison to the deputies, to make that call. I'm not familiar with that particular statute. Thank you. Um, Mr. Morris? What legal standard would you use to stop a car? What standard and process would you use to search that car? Yes, sir. Uh, that falls under general statute 20, traffic enforcement. You have to have reasonable suspicion to stop a vehicle. Um, your reasonable suspicion, then you can move that up to probable cause to search the vehicle. If you have the odor of marijuana come emitting from the vehicle, that's automatic probable cause. You don't need to ask them. You, have, you pull them out of the vehicle and you, you, you know, you respectfully ask me to get out of the vehicle and you tell them that you're going to um, search the vehicle. Um, if you just have reasonable suspicion and you think there's some indicators that there may be some uh, uh, foul play there, then you can ask for consent. You can ask for consent to search the vehicle. Whether you get that or not uh, depends on the person and your gift of gab. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I think that uh, reasonable suspicion is the uh, legal standard to stop a car. Um, Again, I've, I've taught that stuff for 20 years, so it's, it's, it's the legal standard. Um, probable cause is when you make an arrest or when you search. Um, that means they probably did it. Um, that's the standard that you, that you go by. Um, and when you're searching a vehicle, there's some unique laws that, that are there. 
It's called the Carroll Doctrine. It's almost 100 years old. It'll be 100 years old in a couple of years. Um, the uh, the Carroll Doctrine allows for the search of a vehicle uh, as long as it's not on private property uh, without a search warrant. So you don't need a search warrant if you have probable cause. Um, and I, I would agree with Mr. Morris. I think consent is always a good thing. You can always ask. Thank you. I'll tell you, uh, gentlemen here in the audience, something interesting, a little side tidbit. Uh, my home county, Surrey County, four years ago, was taken to the Supreme Court on a traffic stop that resulted in a big traffic, uh, uh, I mean, a big dress, uh bust on Interstate 77. <clears throat> the lawyers had taken it to the Supreme Court based on the fact that one of the taillights was out in the vehicle, but North Carolina law stated that you only needed one taillight to be considered a vehicle. And thank God that the U.S. Supreme Court said, uh-uh. And so Surrey County is known for beating the, beating the defense lawyers on a, on a, on a traffic light taillight issue. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. So go from there. They actually changed state law. Before. That's right. They changed, mm -hmm. It's correct. They changed the state law afterwards. because So now you can't find that you need multiple taillights now on your vehicle. <laughs> And it was also eliminated the man with the whip in front of the hot, the car. <laughs> so it doesn't scare the horses was eliminated during the change of that law, too. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Mr. Johnson. Since most of the time-consuming duties of the sheriff is managing his administration duties, detention staff, how do you feel about your past experience that will allow you to manage the team effectively? I think there's a difference between managing and leadership. Um, I do think that being out and active with the people in the office certainly will, will go towards that leadership. Uh, management of the people is actually taking care of the day-to-day -day task. I think you, you put people in the right places, uh, put people that are familiar with what, what to do, train them appropriately on what to do, which I think is a, is a problem. You give them adequate training, and you get out of the way. And then you come back and check on them periodically to make sure things are going right. Um, you know, good, good people doing good work don't need someone standing over their shoulder all the time. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the follow-up needs to be done periodically just to, to make sure things are going well like you want them. Um, but you train people appropriately. But I think you, you, it's two different things there with leadership and management, and I think that's, that's a big deal. And I think that leadership is done by, by going out and being in front and being involved. Thank you very much. Mr. Morris? Yes, sir. You manage programs and you lead people. And you have to put leaders in the right position. And if you have good leaders, people will follow. All right? And, um, and that, that goes in part of what I want to change at the sheriff's office. We need to have a standard of conduct. You need to meet a checklist of requirements to, to move up to a recommendation for promotion. You have to have X number of years before you can be eligible for promotion, not just, hey, I like you and you're, my, you're going to be my next sergeant. It, it can't be that way. You have to do it fair. Mr. Owens. Uh, part of my... I feel it's my strong leadership skill is I don't micromanage. We hire professionals, and you really hope that they're going to do their job professionally. That doesn't mean you don't check in and check up to see what's going on, but you shouldn't have to sit there and tell somebody how to do their job. Now, training is important, and in our company, we have a budget so our, our team members can take training. So my, my goal would be is to check their training, what training are they lacking, and, and get them trained. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if I took care of that. <clears throat> Mr. Morris, go ahead and take the microphone on this one. They all want to make sure it's even, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> There's been a lot of questions submitted about trash on the highways <laughs> and trash in the roadways. Um, and I um, want to get your opinion on it only because I served as vice chairman of our zoning and planning. And I know we had an issue like that, and most people don't realize that uh, DOT, particularly on the highways, is responsible for that. 
I also know that Cooper, because of budgetary reason, cut third parties out of cleaning and cutting the grass. I think it was about three years ago. Um, and sometimes the sheriff's departments aren't really responsible for keeping the highways and streets clean. But there are some sheriffs in the state that have developed a work with programs where they will get some of the detainees uh, to help clean up. Some sheriffs like it, some don't. So give us a quick answer what you, you know, what you would do if, uh, e even if it's combating DOT, what you would do to help these folks see beautiful highways and beautiful roads in Granville. There's nobody in this room that can't deny that our roadways look awful. I mean, and that's why it's on my platform is to combat that. I'm going to be one of those sheriffs that have detainees. Um, you can't take somebody just out of jail who's awaiting trial and go there. But you have people who have been sentenced and they're put back into the jails. And they, they may have community service hours they need to do. So what I'm going to do is get them to sign a waiver and make sure that it's, you know, everything's legal, run it through the uh, county attorney, and everything's good, and let them accumulate their hours. But as I'm driving around um, through the county meeting folks, I'm going to note which roads need attention first. Now, what I'll do is, is set a set of orders that morning. Nobody will know what road we're going on because I don't want anyone to know, plant anything out there for a detainee. But we're going to clean this stuff up, and we can, you know, I'm going to try to build relationships with the DOT so we can maybe work on it together. But absolutely, we got to clean these roads up. Give me four years, and you're not going to see any trash on the side of the road. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Owens. You know, what comes to mind is uh, my brother is a contractor for the government. He was in uh, Cairo, Egypt, and he sent me back a picture, and the trash in between lanes was six foot tall. You know, it's just, it's unreal. It's very, and here sometimes, you, know, you, you don't see that much trash, but it's so unsightly. I, I can't, you know, I'm like, kind of like Mr. Moore said, I can't stand that's the, all that trash in the road. But, you know, I grew up in a small fisherman town, and I may have gotten in trouble for a fight one time and had to pull some community service, but that's exactly what we did. It wasn't where you, you know, you got a, a record or your life ruined because you made a stupid mistake. They put you on community service. You picked up trash. You washed and waxed the fire truck. You washed and waxed police cars. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a good plan to, to look at that. For inmates, it's a little tougher because then you're going to have to use sheriff's resources, someone out there with a shotgun, making sure you know, nobody's going to run off or they find, like I said, a stash weapon. So, but, yeah, I'm, I'm for community service. If we can get our young folks in community service instead of the system, I'd use them out there. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I, I totally disagree with using the inmates because we pay taxes to the state. And the state was doing it, just like the, the moderator said, up to a few years ago until they figured out, hey, we're going to take that money and do something else with it. The, the communities need to stand up and demand that the state pick this program up and fix it. I, was, uh, I lived in Texas for a while. If you're familiar with Texas, you don't mess with Texas. <laughs> And what that means is, I didn't know it. My wife had lived in Texas for many years, and I didn't know what it was. People would go by and blow the horn. They'd about run you off the road if you threw something out the window. You didn't mess with Texas. And that program's been in place for over 35 years. They've got receptacles all over the place to, to put trash in. It's still very effective. Our state needs to take, a, take an approach that's going to that fix the problem and get ahead and clean up our highways or stop taking our tax dollars. I don't think the, the taxes from Granville County, it, it would be from two different sources. You're gonna pay you're gonna pay me to do it, right? In three years, the sheriff's office answered over fifty-seven thousand calls for service. Fifty-seven thousand. No, I'm not gonna have somebody on the roadside with a shotgun. I'm gonna call on my state, I'm gonna ask my county government to, to go to the state and tell them they need to get back to work and clean up our roadways. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We're gonna throw this question to you. How would you uh, handle disorderly demonstration riots? Believe it or not, it's a question. I, I just picked up the paper the other day and I read about all these riots up here in Oxford, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was a submitted question. Uh, we're, we're disorderly. Well, I think that um, 
when teaching constitutional law, the very first thing I tell officers is our job is to protect the citizens' rights, period. You start there and you build on it. And they're told that over and over again. I think demonstrations are fantastic until they cross a line. I think that's how America was founded and I think how, how it was built is people need to get out and speak their mind. But don't cross that line and start damaging people's property and becoming disorderly because I'm going to put you in jail. That's all it is to it. I mean, wh what are we doing here? We're, we're, I'm watching on TV and people are tearing things up and we have officers standing around watching it. Absolutely ridiculous. I will call all resources in to make it as peaceful as possible. If you're peaceful, demonstrate against anything you want to, please. Don't, if you become not peaceful, then we have an issue. Mr. Morris. I couldn't have been a police officer in Durham or Chapel Hill when they took those statues down and put ladders on them. I would have been fired. That's property damage. If somebody wants to come into this county and, and do a, a protest or a march or whatever, I'm going to meet with that leader, and we're going to go through some guidelines. And we're going to set boundaries, and I'm going to tell them, if anything goes wrong, I'm coming to find you. Okay, now we had an incident here that happened in the middle of the night and there's a lot of people that aren't happy about that and one of our monuments was removed. Now that's history, okay, and that belongs to the people of Granville County and I think we should vote on that to get that statue back up. Mr. Allen. Can you hit the question again, please? What would, you do, what would you do chance. with the civil unrest? riotous situations you know i've had uh i've traveled with our company all over and i've been to portland downtown i've been to seattle places that were very beautiful and to see you know these riots and they're, they're riots you have instigators come in even if you have a, a you know a peaceful protest there always seems to be some instigators that show up and they want to start trouble and to me i'm not going to have my deputy stand by and watch somebody bust a window out you know, it, it's not going to happen. They're going to be arrested on the spot. And these DAs in some of these places, defund the police or letting people out on cashless bail, that same person's out an hour later back at the riot. And we can't have that. So I, I honestly I feel that, no, we're not going to allow rioting. You want to protest? I love protests. You know, you know it, this place says we were born on protest in the United States. But protesting a riot... They're not mostly peaceful protests that people are burning and blowing things up. Difference between protesting and rioting, rioting two different is things. <clears throat> uh, while you have the microphone, Mr. Rones, what are your thoughts about minimal sentencing requirements as a way to reduce crime? Uh, I, I think, you know, we tried a lot of that back during the Bush administration, when three strikes are out and everything. So I, I think you have to handle the individual case. To me, you know, if, if you're under 18 and you do something stupid, I'm not talking about killing anybody, but do you want to ruin that person's life for one mistake? They should not get that minimum sentence. It should be strictly the law applied fairly, but you look at each individual situation. I don't think mandatory sentences like that will work uh, unless you're hitting fentanyl or something, then yeah, mandatory life sentences is, is what's going to work. Okay. Mr. Morris? We need to be tough on crime. There are so many times that I have arrested somebody and they're habitual and they don't go to court for a year and they get more charges and more charges. The police officers are doing their job. The detectives are doing their job. They're making good cases. The problem is when it goes up, they don't get prosecuted correctly, or they take a plea, or this. So it's time to vote some, some people in there that will give tougher sentences. These habituals, it's just they're called career criminals, and we got to put an end to that. Mr. Johnson. I, I would say that a, that a career criminal apprehension program would be um, appropriate in the Granville County Sheriff's Office where you identify uh, people that are repeat offenders and you get some agreement on uh, appropriate prosecution and going to trial um, and, and asking for appropriate sentencing. I would agree 
uh, with the Mr. Morris there that people are getting out and they're getting out way too soon. They're not being punished. Um, and and I, th I don't think there should be a mandatory minimum for all crimes. Certain crimes, yes. And I have seen that work. I saw it work with crack cocaine. I saw it uh, work with five-year enhancements with uh, gun crimes. You know, you get five extra years if you got a gun and drugs together. And I saw that work because people would take their gun and hide it so that they would not associate it with the drugs. So it did work. Uh, but I don't think it works for all crimes. I think you've got to identify the, the criminals that are causing the most problems because, believe me, it's the same people over and over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. again. Uh, give the mic to Mr. Morris. We'll go ahead. And, well, let's make this short. We're trying to wrap it up here. We still got a few more questions. Uh, short answer: What type of crime here do you see as the biggest threat to the community, and how would you propose to address it? I believe that the biggest crime has to do with drugs, and it ties into breaking and entering and cutting off these cattle and converters. People are desperate to get these highs and they're gonna do anything they can to get the money. And if it's to break, once you steal from your own family members, then you can go out and steal from anybody. That's what these addicts are doing. But we need to get some programs to help these addicts. Um, if I, if an addict needs some help, come and see me, but don't come to see me after you've been arrested. How I'll would you handle it? Handle what? The, the, the drug problem that you were mentioning. It's part of the question. Okay, yes sir. Uh, well, we gotta be tough on drugs. I mean, arrest. We gotta arrest these drug dealers so it's not available to them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Owens? You know, <clears throat> I agree. Drugs are the biggest problem. And, uh, you know, the increased patrol like an their addiction is, is a way to get some of it. But, uh, you know, you're going to have to rely also on your citizens to give you an idea of where this is showing up. Uh, you know, the amount of deaths from, from fentanyl is just unreal. It's just unreal. And we really have to get that off, off the street. So that would be my, my main goal on that, you know, is to get rid of the, crack down on the drugs. Um, you know, it's habitual offenders. Yeah, you gotta put them away for a while. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I, I think drugs, drugs is definitely a, a big issue and it does relate to so many other crimes. Uh, the biggest problem with that is drugs don't know a jurisdiction. They don't know county lines. They don't know city and town lines. There's got to be cooperation uh, with the whole region, with cities and towns and counties. There needs to be cooperation there to identify people because they don't know lines. Uh, they, they will stay in that motel in Oxford and they will sell drugs in Henderson and they'll go to Durham. And, they don't, and, and we, we're not addressing that by cooperating. You cooperate locally, you involve federal prosecution for the, for the for the real bad guys, and you put them in federal prison for 20 years for selling fentanyl. You know, stop being soft on people like that. You know, let's put people away, and people will learn that we got to stop this, or they're going to lock us up for a long time. You use federal prosecution, but it takes cooperation on a massive level to correct it, because guess what? Drug dealers cooperate. Thanks. And while you have the microphone, question was asked on what you would do to improve 911 response time. I, I think that was asked in the beginning. But was it? I'm sorry. Um, no, but I, it, I, I may forget. 911 well, was a similar question, but um, 911 response time, I've actually started reviewing, because it's a lot of calls, as I've mentioned, started reviewing a lot of the response times uh, with the sheriff's office, and I think that you can increase those times, again, by having data-driven policing, intelligence-led policing, where people are already in the area when they're dispatched to the call, because that's where crimes are happening. Um, you put patrols in areas where you need the response and you will cut response times, no doubt about it. Um, I do think that we, we are in a position where we probably need more patrols. I've seen instances of four or five deputies working at one time. Have you tried to drive from Bullock, North Carolina to Creedmoor? And that's what they're having to do. It's a long drive, right? So I think we need to make sure our resources are well placed and we need to be identifying these hot spots that are happening in our community. Thank you. <clears throat> Morris. Number one response time. Uh, I'm not sure right now if there's GPSs on the car or if 911 has access to where they're at. But 
I agree. There's going to be certain areas that are more prominent to crimes reoccurring over and over. You have to have your people in the right locations and zone patrol. And if you need to double up with two deputies in, in zone three between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., or excuse me, 6 p.m. And, and midnight, then that's what you need to do. Utilize your crime analyst. Start looking at things. Um, but these officers got to be um, more mobile, not sitting stationary, you know, take your breaks. But also, you got to do teamwork. You know, if you happen to be closer and not tied up on anything, you got to stand up and, and, and take those calls. Thank you very much, Mr. Owens. Uh, I, I think, you know, part of that is, is we have to have another substation that's, that's farther out in the country. You know, I drove through uh, Bullock and Stovall, and there's a lot of distance out there. If you're having to come from Oxford or you're having to come from Creedmoor, that's a lot of distance to cover. And, you know, we, we don't want our deputies doing 120 miles an hour down a country road. So we need to figure out a way, how can we get another uh, substation and have our deputies be able to work out that substation that are in that area to give them the shorter response time. <clears throat> While you have the uh, microphone, <clears throat> uh, what experience dictates you to prepare and uh, work with an $11 million budget? Well, actually, the budget's a little more than that now. <laughs> it's $14 million, but... I'm only reading the question <laughs> that was submitted. You know, Do don't, sh don't shoot the piano player. <laughs> our, our, uh, our company, we run on about uh, three and a quarter million dollar budget. So we're small. But when you get into the budgets and you start looking at them, you do have a lot more bureaucracy when you come into working with government. You know, and, and I was going over the budget at a high level. And one thing that stuck out to me, too, I just got to bring up. Starting deputies only make $36,000 a year starting out. That's $17.50 an hour for them to go out there and put their life on the line. So we need to get prices up on that. We need to, the lower tiers need to make more money. We need not to be a a farm that just trains deputies and sends them off to other agencies. Um, so that's, that's the budget that we have. I want to dissect that budget. I want to see if there's any way we can take money from other areas that we may not, may not be using it and push that money over to salaries. You know, if I have to feed the, the inmates at the prison bologna sandwiches every day so my deputies can learn, at, I mean, can um, actually earn a living wage, $36,000 is not really earning a living wage. Uh, thank, thank, you, Mr. thank you, it's, uh, it's uh, roll. Huh? <laughs> Mr. Morris's turn. My experience working with the budget, in the military I, I was responsible for $5 million worth of equipment and that had to do with replacement. So you have to budget that in um, into the fiscal years. Right now, any county department uh, works along with the commissioners and they do budget reviews, okay? So that's a team effort there. You look at last year's budget and you, you dictate what do you need this time. Um, so you have all these breakdowns of personnel benefits, operating costs, uh, vehicles, and debt services. Um, it's simple, it's just like balancing your checkbook. You have, to, you have to look at that. And what I wanna leave you with is tonight, if I walk in that office, I'm gonna save the county uh, between 11, excuse me, between 10 and $12,000 a year by waiving my medical expense. I won't need medical coverage. I'm covered through the military, through the VA, and that's 10 to $12,000 we can use possibly to get a new canine or a new vehicle, put money towards a vehicle. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I do believe Clint down there is right about the, the, the current year budget. Uh, the last full budget, though, where they, a complete budget cycle, um, 8.4 million was the, the actual sheriff's office, uh, roughly, and less than 9% of that is really your operating expenses. So it's about 700,000 of that is your operating expenses because you have personnel costs and you have so many things that you don't have control over as a sheriff, okay? Uh, the detention center is very similar, 3.1 million, uh, less than 20% of that is actually operating cost. And keep in mind, I'm not talking about paying a light bill either that comes out of that. So really budgeting comes down to knowing how to, to maneuver that little bit of money to buy your vehicles and to operate, right? It's, 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 a, it's kind of a, a moving picture there. I was in a budget meeting two days ago, 
You know, we operate with our, over a $5 million budget now. I was in a budget meeting just two days ago. Um, I've been doing, I've been in budget meetings and, and dealing with budgets for well over 15 years of, of law enforcement. Uh, and law enforcement budgets are different than, the, than in the civilian world. Thank you very much. Um, give Mr. Morris the mic, we'll let him do this. <clears throat> Since this is close to my heart, this has to deal with uh, sheriff's relationship with students in the elementary school. The question is, <clears throat> how can you prove the presence of sheriffs in our school to promote a positive relationship with our students beginning with elementary schools? For example, greeting students as they enter schools so they grow up thinking it is normal to see them and trust them whenever they have a problem. Uh, feeling we talked about earlier, or someone it was mentioned about SRO work. Yes, sir. Um, could we elaborate a little bit what you yeah. all feel is needed for the youth to get more trust within law enforcement? Absolutely. You know, there's nothing more discouraging when, when a, a, a parent sees a police officer and their kids not acting right. Well, I'm going to turn you in, and, you know, there's a cop. You know, that gives us a bad, a bad image. Um, I left patrol, and I took a position as a school resource officer, and they sent me to an inner city middle school, and I didn't know what in the world I got into. Um, it was like herding cats. But what I found out is that some of these children were missing something in their lives, and if you put the right person in that school that can develop a relationships with these people, the sky's the limit for these kids. And you have to have a, a, the right person in the job that cares and wants to do that and build relationships with these children and, and you know, just be a mentor because something might be missing. So I believe in relationships. I believe in 100% uh, coverage in the schools, elementary, middle, and high schools. And uh, I'm all for SROs. Thank you. Give it to Mr. Johnson. We'll switch it back the other way. Don't want anyone to say I'm not being fair. <laughs> I, th I think the question was about the elementary schools, and I, th I think elementary schools are certainly different. Um, I've, I've been a part of programs where officers go and, and eat lunch uh, with, the, with elementary schools. You do that, you vary that. I think that's successful because you can see officers in a different light. Um, not only that, I think you interact with that age group differently. Um, I, I actually applied for and received a grant to operate a youth camp for that age group of a 10 to 11 a year old age group in the summertime. So I think you interact with them differently so that they don't see you as that officer. When they see you in food line, they say, hey, Vance, right? It's not Chief Johnson. Um, so they, they see you differently. So I think you interact with that age group a little differently than you do others. Um, as far as SROs go, I, I have actually read the contract that the county has um, with the school system, and, and there's some issues I've got with that. Um, I've, I've actually instituted those con those uh, contracts in the past and there's some problems that I've got with the contract that I don't think we're very specific with. Um, I don't think SROs should be in school enforcing school rules. I don't think SR I don't think officers should be enforcing mask mandates at the meetings, right? Because that's part of the part of that. So that's that's kind of some things that need to be revamped, but SROs are mentors in our schools first and foremost. Thank you, Mr. Owens. You know, I think it's about um, relationships. That's the big thing. And, you know, for our company, that's part of our tagline, build relationships. You have a chance to build relationships with, with these younger kids. I coached Pop Warner football for about four years, the Capital City Steelers. And you had a lot of kids that come from single-parent families, you know, uh, that didn't, you know, have enough to eat or they got one meal a day. And the compassion and that you have for these children and to see them five years later and they go, coach, coach, you know, <laughs> and come up and give you a hug. That's what you need. You know, the, the younger the kids need to know that they matter, that they are important, and they're loved. And I think as a law enforcement, you can do all of that with no problem at all. You know, so I, I'm, I'm very much for building those relationships with the, with the young kids and stuff. It goes a long way. And you never know until, you know, you come back five or ten years later and somebody says, hey, coach, the advice you gave me, it made a difference in my life. Thank you. Hold on the microphone, Mr. Owens. Um, just a point of privilege, be, me being the uh, moderator, a uh, good friend of mine, some of you might have heard of Darren Campbell, is the sheriff of Iredale County. I uh, actually took the program that I used to run and, and was vice national vice president for police athletic leagues. 
He calls it the Sheriff Athletic Leagues at Iredale, and it basically involves sponsoring Girl Scout, Boy Scout, Explorer programs as young Cub Scouts. So, you know, sometimes the course of being SRO is not the total course to get the youth involved within, you know, within liking law enforcement or liking within the governmental systems. So everywhere I go, and I'm talking affirmative, one of you as a Republican nominee and the next Republican sheriff should get with Sheriff Campbell of Iredale County and see he's having very much great success with that program. And he's sponsoring sports and scout programs, and it's very, very successful. That's the basic concept of the Police Athletic Leagues. So we have talked quite a bit here, and a lot of information has passed. So let's give them one last round of applause. So we can give them a little energy for that last shot, closing statement, sell you on voting on whoever. But I will tell you that I did tell all of the great folks here, the candidates, they've all made a pledge. No matter what happens after the primary, we all are going to unite and make sure that there's a Republican sheriff in this county. And if each and every one of you don't work your butts off, I will come back up here with my size 15s and make sure that you do. I'm going to give you one last question, and then we're going to go into the closing statements. And I think the reason I held this question for the last, it kind of, in my heart, not knowing your situation and not knowing what's going on in the community, reflects how the society feels or the community feels about the sheriff. And said, let me ask all candidates, please. It says, we live in a society where we do not know who to trust. And with the ranking of sheriff, which is a high standard, are you really going to be truthful and honest in doing what's right? When the opposite occurs, as we've seen in the past, that's betraying the voters who vote in you, what would you do to really gain the trust of the community back to the sheriff's office again? Which, again, I don't know the full story, but apparently that's a repeating theme and a repeating question that I have seen tonight with these questions that you all submitted to the party officials. So, Mr. Owens, you have the mic. Please start. I think the main thing is you have to get in front of the people. You have to take the time to invest in the people with a relationship. You know, you're not going to be able to say, hey, trust me, and they're not going to immediately trust you. But when you get in there and interacting and you're working with them, you're trying to make their community better for them, they start to loosen up and they're going to talk to you. They're going to tell you what's going on in their community. But it all starts with face-to-face meetings, getting out there, letting people know that, hey, I'm not the old guard. You know, uh, I'm someone different. I have integrity, and this is the way I'm going to lead. Thank you, Mr. Morris. I've been at agencies where the department's moral compass didn't align with mine or their ethics or whatever reason, and I left. I'm not afraid to step away and go to another agency. That's the kind of environment I want to um, instill in the Granville County Sheriff's Office, one that has high morals, one that can be trusted and is truthful, and we're transparent. And that's why I based my campaign on the three T's. Those things are dear to my heart. I, I don't know why people didn't say anything or stood by through all that stuff. I think it was just a culture through that time, and, and shame on them. They need to, you know, pray on that and, and just do better from here on out. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. But, you know, hopefully they can find it in their soul to say, you know, I, I learned from this. I should have said something. And that, that's what courage comes in. But uh, I believe in people need a second chance, and uh, I just want to be a leader for the people. Johnson? I think that uh, trust is definitely not demanded, and it's earned. So I think day one, you can't expect people to trust you. I think it's something that has to be earned. 
Um, and it's earned over time by consistently doing the right thing for the right reasons. So I don't think day one that you can expect the, the public to, to, to fully trust you because of the, the culture and the atmosphere that they're familiar with. Um, but, but to tell you about myself, I live my personal life like that. My kids will tell you. When I get home and something's in my bag that, it, that we didn't pay for, guess what? It goes back, right? It's small things like that. You do the right thing because it's the right thing, and you do it whether people are looking at you or not. And eventually, people will, you will earn people's trust. But you're not going to do it day one. Guarantee you, no matter whatever I say, what any of these candidates say, you're not going to step in that office and have respect, then they trust you. It's just not going to happen. You have to earn it. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Great response. <laughs> Let's As promised, we tried to keep it within two hours. We ran a little bit over two hours. Um, each candidate will have two minutes for closing. Uh, and then afterwards, they'll assemble in the lobby. You can ask them personal questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, feel free to do so. This is an education form. So I could tell you as a former candidate, everybody has this feeling of, should I go first in closing statement? Or do I want to go last? I don't want to be the middle. So to make it fair, gentlemen, Sandy, give me a, give me a from one to three. Two. Two. So, Mr. Morris, you're going to be the first one. And then uh, to make it fair, we'll make Mr. Johnson and Mr. Owens. Okay, thank you very much again for being here and your undivided attention. If there is anything that I didn't answer for you, that I can't answer for you, please reach out to me. If I wasn't clear on something, please reach out to me. Or, you know, a different question. Um, I commend these two guys for stepping up and wanting to do better, you know, and, and I'd be honored if I'm not the uh, elected candidate to move forward to the general, um, um, I will support them. I believe that they have the same um, goals in mind, and that's to make this place better for the people. Okay. So, once again, I hope that I can earn your support. I'm, I'm doing this for the people. My kids are grown now. I got nothing but time. I'll put in a 70 hour work week. It doesn't matter to me. But this is what I know. I know how to be a public servant and I know how to fix things. And, but I'm open. I, I just have one idea. You, there's 60,000 ideas in this county and I'll be happy to listen to every one of them. So thank you very much. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. And how I did that was I had a one, two, three order. That's why I asked her to pick the number, and that's how I got the first, second, and third. So, three. yes, Sandy. So I'm just trying to do this. Yes, this is two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and for, wait, for you to be two minutes, point two seconds. So he's going to make sure. Two, two real minutes. That's the halfway mark. I don't know if I was clear on that. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I, I want to thank everybody for coming out and on a Friday night spending all this time listening to us. I think it's uh, it's valuable, and, and you can take this information and carry it back to your many friends and family. Uh, please do that. Share your thoughts. Share what you saw here tonight. I think that's important. There are 31,000 registered voters, right? So those are the people we need to, we need to talk to as Republicans. Uh, convince people to switch from that Democratic Party. Uh, make sure they're registered right. Because I think I still got family that's registered Democrat, right? Because we were told at 18, register as a Democrat. <laughs> so, you know, that we need to fix that issue, and I think that's happening. And, and I think we need to be strong about that. So make sure you know how people are registered. Talk to people. Uh, pick your candidates and support them. Um, get passionate about it. Get behind somebody. You know, I think I'm the most experienced, qualified candidate, and I think that shows. That's me, right? That's me speaking. I'm going to speak highly of myself, right? Um, but I do think I'm the most experienced and qualified person, um, and I wouldn't let you down if you elect me as sheriff. I will not let you down. Um, I will be honest with you. Um, sometimes you may not like my honesty, but you're going to always get the truth from me. Um, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear, okay? That's, you're going to get that in politics, but you will not get that from Vance Johnson. Even while I'm campaigning, you're not going to get that from me. 
Um, I really do appreciate y'all coming out here. You're always going to get honesty from me. I really want you to vote. Come talk to me after the meeting. Thank you. Mr. Owens. You know, I've mentioned a couple of times why I think I'm a perfect candidate for the job, and it comes to the business background. You know, there's a lot of business administration that has to be done. Uh, you know, I get around people. Uh, I joke a lot. You know, that's probably a downfall sometimes. But getting out in the public, and the best way to do an icebreaker is to tell a joke to get the people to, to lighten up and, and tell you, you know, what you want to know. But, you know, for me, I want to take that business experience and I want to make a difference, you know. Uh, I don't want to be someone who just says, I'm running for this office because it's prestigious. It's not. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be a lot of sacrifice. But what I look at is, though, how many people have gone from the private sector business, business world into government sector and made a big difference? We only need to go back, you know, to the Trump administration to see that. So when I'm you know, here today, today, I'm like the Trump candidate without the mean tweets. So you get, you get an awesome candidate that is ready to lead. And I just want to say thank you for everybody coming out tonight. This has been fantastic. The turnout is, is amazing. I, I'm just so glad that enough people care about this county to come out and, and show their support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's, uh, I'm going to ask the audience if you could stand and give these conservative warriors a really, really strong support. Man. I uh, want to say I'm honored that I was invited by your party to be the moderator. I'm humbled, and I want to go ahead and pass the torch back over to your chairman so he can go ahead and close out the meeting. And if everybody wants to meet the candidates in the lobby, we'll take don't go anywhere, Parker. You should take some pictures so they can put out a press release. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Pick the, tr pick the trash up. So thank you all very much. We'll see you in the lobby, and God bless you. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. All right. How, how confident are we in this room that the next sheriff is standing right here? It's been a wonderful night. We have one quick announcement from our events chair, and then we're going to close it out. Mr. Johnston brought up a great point. I want to mention this. You have friends and family. A lot of people are registered Democrat because they have always been that way. You have to take something from tonight, and if each and every one of you put something on Facebook, social media, make a point to let people know. Because I hear people all the time go, I want to be involved. I want to help with the Republican Party. You cannot vote in the primary if you're a registered Democrat. We need you to talk to people. Do that. Also, secondly, your candidates, they come from a long ways away. These guys have put their lives up here to talk to everyone about what they're going to do if they are elected sheriff. You have to support them. If you don't want to write me a check before you walk out the door, then you go online, click on it, $10. And who remembers the $5 McDonald's bag? Exactly. Support our candidates. They need it. And put it in the trash. Yes, make sure you put, yes. Please, Lord, don't litter. My goodness. But make sure you support us. They need it. Okay? Thank you. Okay, before I let you go, you're all standing. Everybody wants to go. I need to send a shout-out to Tim Karen. He's one of our elected officials that is running also this year. County Commissioner, District 6. Standing in front of Tim is Danielle Hayes, our District 5 school board candidate. Marilyn Avila, we don't know where the lines are going to be drawn. So we're just happy you're here. And we have Sandy Smith, one of our congressional candidates. We don't know where she's going to land, and we don't know where Granville is going to land. Uh, real quick. Pastor Jordan Cooper, I have a number of announcements, but I'm not going to keep anybody else. Facebook, Facebook, and email. Um, we, we, we have a number of events coming up that are very, very important. Please look at and their website, website, Facebook, and email. Be watching in the next four or five days for all the announcements going on uh, in March. And
Pastor Cooper, will you close us out? And, yes. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, we again come to you and just say thank you. God, I ask right now that you strengthen these candidates. God, as they're out and about, keep them safe. God, help them to represent you as uh, they try to represent this county. God, I ask for traveling graces for, for everybody here. I ask for uh, energy to, to be bestowed upon all of our candidates that are running. God, because we know that uh, we want to get close to you. And the closer we get to you, the more we can lead this county in the right way. And the state and our communities and our children's lives will all be affected, God. And please, God, keep us safe as we travel. God, and help us to have a light in our eyes and a light in our hearts. So when they see us, they see you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 I wrote it down twice and forgot. What a great moderator. Amen.